Good afternoon. Uh, welcome all to our children's Christmas Eve service. A very special welcome to all of those who are uh, watching online or who may be watching a little bit later to see uh, family, of course, maybe children, grandchildren, but especially to praise God for the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. May the ministry of our children and the gospel of Jesus, our Savior, be a blessing to us all on this holy day. Please stand as we confess our sins together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child, but trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the merits and for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus alone, your sins have been washed clean forever. Your sins are forgiven. You are at peace with God. Let us pray. Holy Father, bless our worship as we gather to remember the birth of your Son. Fill us with the light of your gospel that we may live in peace and quietness. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We light the Advent wreath and rejoice that tonight all of the candles are lit. We light one candle to remember the prophecies made about Jesus that fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures and were fulfilled in Christ. We light one candle to remember the journey made by Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem as she was getting ready to deliver her firstborn son. We light one candle to remember the shepherds who witnessed and worshipped the newborn baby and praised him with the angels. We light one candle to remember the Gentiles that were drawn to Christ, such as the Magi from the East, because the gospel is for all nations. We light the white candle in the center of the wreath to praise Jesus Christ our Lord, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, to save us from our sins. Amen. The birth of Jesus foretold. Christ's birth was foretold many times to God's Old Testament people beginning with Adam and Eve, on down to the visions of the prophet Daniel. Christ's birth was anticipated from the beginning of time. But now an angel of God appeared to Mary to tell her the amazing news. She herself be the mother of the Son of God. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee.
In the first chapter of Matthew, we hear how another angel tells Joseph that Mary, who was not yet married to him, was going to give birth to a baby that was not his child, but would be his Savior and ours. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Song of Praise, the Magnificat, serves as our confession of faith tonight. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me last. For when anyone has done great things for me, holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. Remember him to be merciful. Save Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. 
Please rise for the gospel. The Christmas gospel is a portion of our gospel lesson that the children um, were reciting for us from Luke chapter 2, verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Luke 2 verse 4 is not a difficult prophecy in the Bible. It is not a, an obscure bit of poetry that has to be picked apart. It is simply um, an historical part of the account of what's happening um, here in the story of the birth of the Savior. And it has the same sort of meaning that we would have if we were to say, you know what, Joe lived up in Glencoe, but he came down to Cortland for a week. It, that's basically what's happening here, but we want to notice the circumstances. We want to notice the reason why Joseph did this and the circumstances that made it necessary, and also that the trip showed Joseph's faith and teaches us something about our own faith. And finally, Joseph's trip from Nazareth to Galilee to Bethlehem, um, it fulfilled two prophecies that had been made about 300 years apart and at least 700 years in the past. And here they were coming together, showing that Joseph shared more than just the house and the line or lineage of King David. Joseph shared David's faith, and he showed it. Israel had once been a very large nation made up of several tribal states, a little bit like the way that our America is divided up into various states. But after the time when King David died, and after his son Solomon died, owing to some sins on the part of, of David's son and his grandson and the people, uh, the country was torn in half. Actually, it was torn into ten-twelfths and two-twelfths. And after some time went by, an enemy came and attacked the northern ten-twelfths. And most of those people were carried away into captivity and had to be enslaved. And uh, the, the, the Jews from the southern tribe of Judah, that's where we get that word Jew, they were left almost all alone as God's people. And the kings of those Jews in the southern tribes, they didn't really learn their lesson from what had happened to the northern tribes. And soon after, another powerful enemy came, and this time they were up to the gates of Jerusalem itself. And the Jews this time were forced to go away into captivity. And after 70 years, the Jews got to come back. They were brought back again. Unlike the people from up north, the southerners were restored and they rebuilt the walls and they rebuilt their homes and they put up their city and they rebuilt the temple of God. And they were sorry about the way that they had sinned. And more years went by and still the Jews were waiting for a promise God had made many years before and several times along the history of the world. God had promised a Savior, and still the Jews were waiting for the Savior to come. The Savior who was prophesied as one who would be righteous and bringing righteousness. Now, if you... Uh, understand the word righteous, it kind of has two meanings, even in the Bible. It means living and doing what is right, especially what God wants us to do. And there are times in the Bible when God talks about righteous people, individuals, who are living out their faith. But when the, a writer of the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, zeroes in close on somebody and says, but Really, there's no one who is righteous, not even one. Then we realize how sinful we are and the need 
for a savior. And this man in our text, Joseph, going up from Nazareth and, and heading to, to Bethlehem in Judea, he's called a righteous person, although he is not sinless, he's not perfect, but Joseph was a child of God. He used the word of God as a guide for the way that he lived out his life. And he also trusted in God for forgiveness and that God was going to bring about the Savior. Joseph also carefully kept uh, human laws. And there are times when those human laws don't always seem reasonable to us who are citizens under a human government. But the Roman emperor, Caesar, who was ruler of, you know, just about every inch of land at this time that touched the Mediterranean Sea. And, and he was emperor over all of it. And um, he needed money to run his government. And you know how we pay, of course you know how we pay taxes every year. They paid taxes every 14 years. And it was how he raised money to pay for the Roman roads and for the navy and the legions of the Roman army and other expenses that the government had. And he allowed the local rulers to take care of how they collected that 14-year tax. And Judea was at this time under the jurisdiction of the bigger country to the north, which now is called Syria. And it went way up there. It was not just what had once been Galilee, but a lot more than that. And the man governing Syria, he may not have actually even been in Syria at this time. He was later. His name was Quirinius. He decided that uh, he was going to have the people of, 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 of Judea, the Jews, go back to their ancestral hometowns to be counted in this census and to pay their taxes. And I got to say, I don't know whether Quirinius was just making things hard on the Jews. Sometimes people did that and still do that. Or whether the Jews were being a little bit stubborn and telling Quirinius, we're going to do this according to our ancestral lands. And sometimes people do that too. But however it, it, it went about, it seems as if almost everybody in Judea had to pack up and go back to where their ancestors had come from and travel for the purpose of this census and how they were going to pay their taxes. And that means that Joseph had to head south. Joseph was from the house and the line of King David. That meant that uh, uh, not only was he from David's extended family, the tribe of Jesse and so forth, and David, who had several sons, but he was specifically from the line of the kings, the line of David. Um, and, you know, and that, that's Joseph, who was Jesus, we would call him stepfather, because, of course, God the Father is Jesus' actual father. And yet, if the genealogy that's recorded in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 3, if that reflects Mary's family line, and I think that it does, then that means that Jesus was not only legally under his stepfather from the line of King David, but also by blood and by ancestry through Mary's line from the house and the line of King David. And to get to Bethlehem, now Mary and Joseph had to travel south um, uh, uh, over or around the mountains of Samaria and Judea. They get pretty high up there. There are roads and things, but it's about 100 miles. And it would have taken them a few days, maybe four days, maybe five days, especially because Mary was great with child. She was in her last weeks of her pregnancy. You know, the Bible never tells us that Mary got to ride a donkey. That's in all of our artwork, right? In all of the manger scenes that we have and so forth. But we don't know that. Of course, if Mary had been my fiance, I would have wanted her to ride. And I would have found a way to get her a donkey to ride on this hundred mile journey. Um, but however it went for them, Mary was pregnant in the final maybe week of her pregnancy, her 40th week, her ninth month. But Mary and Joseph, we're told, had never slept together. Mary was a virgin. In chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, when she's told by the angel Gabriel that you're going to have a son, 
Mary said, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. Actually, in the Greek text in Luke 1, Mary says very carefully, I've never had or known a man. Mary had never slept with anyone. Now, it's a shame that in our culture we have to bring out that point, even especially on Christmas Eve. But we have to remember that there are people, a lot of cynical, unbelieving people in the world who want to challenge what the Bible clearly says and say, well, maybe it was somebody else's child and just not Joseph's. But that's not what Scripture says. That's not what Mary confessed. She had never lain with a man ever. This was a miracle, a virgin birth. And that's what the Bible assures us is the truth. Now, those doubts that get thrown at us and, and, and other doubts that get shouted at, at us at Christmas time and at other times of the year are, are all because, really, the world hates our faith. The devil pokes and jabs at the world with a pitchfork of anger and jealousy and goads the world into saying all kinds of things that are meant to ruin and, 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 and wreck, shipwreck our faith. And I guess that misery loves company. And who's more miserable than the devil on Christmas Eve? Because Christmas Eve, after all, is, is just a, 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 a dress rehearsal, a, a, a pregame show for Good Friday. Because what was coming wasn't just the manger. What was coming was the cross and the victory of Jesus over the devil, over sin, over death and hell. Joseph's faith had led him to obey his government, even when it meant this personal inconvenience. And as they traveled, long before they ever were going to even be on the road home again, in fact, when they had only just arrived down at Bethlehem looking for a room, couldn't find a room anywhere, it was time for Mary to have her baby. And she did. She delivered her baby. Christ the Savior is born. And by the laws of the Jews, because Joseph was Jesus' legal father, stepfather, the lineage could be traced back to King David. And remember what God had promised David. This is in um, uh, Isaiah, or, or rather in uh, First uh, Samuel, or Second Samuel, chapter seven. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, God said, and he will be my son. I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings in, in, inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne, David, will be established forever. And there in the manger he lays, wrapped up, cozy, swaddled tight by his mother, sleeping in the manger. And this was not the usual birth of a king. It was not the usual birth of a baby. There were no midwives to help Mary, no nurses, no doctor. Not even her mom could be there to help. Just as, as Mary and, 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 and just, it was just Mary and her man, Joseph, which was just like Eve and her man, Adam having their babies out in the open air. And, but, you know, Eve also had the promise that the Savior would come from her body. The line of the Savior would be born. And now, from Mary's body, the Savior himself descended from all that way back, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Christ the Savior had arrived at last. All of the sin of mankind from Eve's Sin to mine and yours would be covered forever, has been covered forever by Jesus. Because as I said, what is Christmas but the pregame show for Good Friday? The baby who sleeps tonight in the borrowed manger would sleep in death in a borrowed grave. But both the baby and the man in the grave would wake and be removed from that place of slumber to the, to the joy and, and the delight of everyone who saw him. 
God spoke the word, and the world came into being. And, 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 and God would enter the world as a being and submit to the laws of God and the curse that God placed on the world. And such a birth, with no help from family, with no help from neighbors, from friends, turned away even by the lodging houses. It was a birth that was despised by men, but the angels came and praised it, praised him, praised God for what had happened. What would you do if angels came to you one day and praised you for something you had done? Would you suddenly think, I don't care what anybody else says about what I did. The angels praised what I did. And the angels don't say anything apart from what God gives them to, stay, to say. Wouldn't we stand up to any criticism or any, 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 anything the world would say against us? Here were the angels of God. And this is what Jesus had for his birth. From man, criticism, disinterest, rejection, but from God, praise, honor, glory, eternal thanks. From God the Father, through his emissaries, the angels. And more than this, Christ does something wonderful here in his birth that connects to your birth and mine. Because in his birth, he takes my birth and your birth and all of the sins and the sinfulness that we were born in and even born with, conceived in sin, born in sin, steeped in sin, soaked in it and dripping all over the world with our sinfulness. And Jesus picks it all up with his birth, absorbs it. And like a towel picking up water that's been dripped, spilled onto the floor, he takes all of it into himself and makes his lowly, holy birth our glorious, holy rebirth as we put our faith in this baby who would grow into that man who took up all of our sins and paid the penalty for them. Apart from him, apart from Christ, we have nothing. We can do nothing that pleases God. But beginning here at his birth, he makes us his own. It's such a simple thing that, that really the world and the devil hates because they can't comprehend it. But Isaiah the prophet said it so simply and so clearly. To us, say it with me, to us a child is born. To us a son is given. To us, to us, to us, for us, for our benefit, for our sakes, this child is born. We appreciate the historical fact of Joseph's birth from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. We appreciate the historical fact of Mary's delivery. And we're, 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 we're blown away by the virgin birth and the miraculous conception of Jesus. But we rejoice and praise God with the angels that, that the task that this baby took upon himself to wipe up all of the spill of our sin, to swaddle us in his love, in his grace, in his birth, death, and resurrection. He is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends our understanding guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We join together singing Silent Night.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you fulfilled all of your ancient promises and sent us a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Your Son left the glory of heaven and became flesh of our flesh. He became our brother so that through him we might become your children. We marvel at his grace that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. We are indeed rich for we have peace with you and access to your throne in every need. Dear Savior, give us a simple childlike faith that sees your glory even in your lowliness. Help us all to rejoice in your birth. In sincere faith, we join the song of the angels, share the delight of the shepherds, and adore you with the magi. May the truth, love, and redemption that you have brought dwell in our hearts and lives. Like Mary, may we keep all these things and ponder them in our hearts. And since you came for all people, help us share the good news of great joy we have in you. As you have grown, or as you have shown us your glory on this holy evening, so one day bring us into your glory in heaven, where we will take our places among the saints and angels. There we will forever praise and glorify you for the grace and mercy you have shown to us, poor sinners. Hear us, Lord, for the sake of your name. And we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated as we close with joy to the world. to thank you all for joining us today and thank especially our children 
and our teachers. The students did this over the course of uh, more than two months at St. Paul's Elementary School and here at St. Paul's Church in the fireside room. The bottom half of the tree has been up at school since the end of September. And the students, you saw them without masks, that's because they were there socially distanced one at a time saying their memory verses and singing their hymns. It just took forever. And uh, the teachers, and particularly Philip Wells and Laura Martins, who, um, and Alyssa Griebel, who really helped making sure that all of the children uh, got, may, may, we had them all, as many as we possibly could. There were a couple who might have been socially distanced for the whole time and weren't able to be there, but some of them we even got a little bit later on. Um, and so just a tremendous amount of editing and work um, and, and cooperation on the part of our children. Um, and sometimes, you know, getting a second grader not to do this when they're saying a line can be challenging, but um, it was, it was they, I'm, I'm really proud of the, of the work that our children have done. There are Christmas bags in the uh, coffee uh, narthex for any children who have not already gotten a bag. Most of our school children got them at school, but there might be some here um, who haven't gotten one. Go ahead and grab one on your way out. Uh, please help yourself. There are also still some family activity packets and craft bags available um, uh, in, the, in the same area. And if you have a little one at home who might like to take a scratch board and scratch off and make a beautiful uh, star of Bethlehem come to life, um, grab one of those packets and take it home for them. Or if you want one, go ahead. It's been good to worship with you. God bless you.